Hi, everyone. Welcome back. We are talking about end of year and beginning of year goals. I have the lovely Dr. Jenna with me today, which I'm really excited about. And so we're just going to be talking about setting intentions for the new year, just like the title says, right? I have a really hard time with it. I want everyone to know that this is a hard thing to do, especially when everyone's like, January 1st, I'm going to restart all of my things. I'm going to do this and do that. That's really hard. So let's start slow. Um, Yes. Hello. Welcome. And I'm excited to be joining you today. And you bring up a very interesting point because I just remember like sometimes like, you know, everyone's asking about like, what's your resolution? What's your resolution? Like, that's like the topic of conversation. Cause we're so sick of talking about what we did for the holidays. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I'm just going to say something ridiculous just to see what people like react to. So I thought I was going to learn the harmonica. And then the more I said it, the more I thought it would be a good idea. And that was like 10 years ago. I don't have a harmonica, <laughs> but now after some house cleaning, a harmonica <laughs> has been found. So <laughs> this episode today might really help me formulate my plan to actually do the harmonica. When you sent me that picture yesterday, I was about to die. I thought that was so funny that you found a harmonica. I mean, it's fun. It's catchy. It fits in your pocket. Like you see people with guitars in airports. I'm like, how are you bringing that somewhere? It stresses me out, but not if I had a harmonica. So (laughs) I'm very excited. Well, I'll use this to help keep me accountable. Perfect. So the first thing we're going to do with your harmonica is starting slowly and not feeling like you have to do like a hundred things at once. So we see in the research that sustainable change, whether it anything from weight loss to learning a new instrument to setting a goal about your dizziness, it is required to start slowly and not overcommit to things. So think of yourself, like how many times have I been like, okay, I'm going to start over on Monday or start over at the first of the month, or I'm going to get up at exactly 11 o'clock and then it's 1101 and you're like, I'm just going to wait till noon. Those things Mm -hmm. are really, really, really common patterns, right? So They're also not things that typically last more than 30 days or even more than 10 days. So what are ways that you can break this down, make this realistic for yourself and set both slow and sustainable goals? Yes, I think a big part is we picture this perfect ideal. And if we don't do exactly like 100% perfect, we just don't do it at all. And Mm -hmm. I know one of our favorite sayings was like 80% is good enough. Like I don't need it to be perfect but also let's try to make some very good, like solid little steps to try to get to where we're going to. A B attitude. I'm about it. That's actually how Jenna single-handedly got me through PT school. Fun fact. A B is still above average. I know. Like a C (laughs) is average. Technically, you're right. So a a B attitude for all of our fellow perfectionists out there will really, I think, do, do a number on the good way. Do a number on you, but like in a good way, if that even makes sense. So the first thing that we want to think about, then we think about like setting goals for next year for 2024 or whenever you're listening to this is thinking about the year that just happened. So reflecting on it, taking time to assess what's been achieved, your setbacks, lessons that you've maybe learned throughout the year, whether that's about work or your chronic illness or friends and family, or you move to a new city, like it literally could be anything. What did you do this year? And give yourself credit for that. Because I think a lot of times we're like, oh, well, like this year came and went, and I'm not even going to think about all the cool things I did. I find myself in that spot a lot. I don't know if you do too, but I find myself in that spot a lot. And then I look back and I'm like, the last 12 months have been like very big for me. And I've done a lot of cool stuff. So thinking about that first and foremost. Does that happen to you too? Oh yeah. And I think sometimes we just get so kind of sucked into the wormhole of what we're doing. And we always like, you know, you're busy. You feel like you're jumping around or you're kind of having to switch gears a lot, but you're not taking that step back to be like, oh, that all like kind of accumulated into something here. And Mm -hmm. I should really be like giving myself more credit for all the stuff that I've done, but it's just kind of hard to take that step back. And then it's even harder to give yourself that type of validation too. Totally. And I think a lot of times, especially in dizziness, people are like, well, I'm still dizzy. 
like I've made this progress, but like I'm still dizzy. And I think that we really, we should probably do a whole episode on this of like ways to track your dizziness that aren't like, are am I dizzy today or not? But I think it's important to recognize that we are often still dizzy after these different treatments and management programs and doing this and doing that and that it takes time and it takes a lot of repetition and a lot of effort. Not that you're not trying, but it takes a long time time to get to a place where you're like, oh, I'm not dizzy 24 seven. Um, if that is realistic for you, which usually it is realistic. So kind of taking your time and giving yourself that credit is so, so important. Yeah. I think if I'm not telling someone about mindset, my probably other broken record speech is like, there's more than one way to define success, more than one way to define Mm -hmm. progress. And even though maybe the kind of universal one might be like, I don't want to feel this at all. Like, until we get to that point, there's going to be these different shifts, which might be, I'm able to do more without aggravating anything. Or when I do Mm -hmm. have a flare, I don't go into the spiral and make it worse. Or if it is really bad, like I know I can come out the other side and my overall like view and attitude towards this has been so helpful in like being able to get back to my other things. Like I'm starting to do these other things. Like there's so many things that you can use. And if we don't see it that way, we think, well, another year and I haven't changed when actually you have. Totally. We definitely need to do a full episode on different ways to measure this. It's such an important concept. I was like, stop me now or I'm going to keep going. And we'll be like, what was this about? (laughs) Totally. Okay, so after you reflect on your last year through all of the things, you kind of make a a list of things that you've done this year and reflect on all of them. I think it's important is setting clear and specific goals. And the way they teach you to do this in PT school is through a SMART goal, goal, which is specific, measurable, actionable, uh, reasonable, right? And time bound, realistic, reasonable, and time bound. Um, and you can do a quick Google of like exactly how to do that. We don't need to bore you on the exact details of a SMART goal. I think they probably spent like literally weeks teaching us how to write a SMART goal for insurance purposes, but you just need to do it for you purposes. <laughs> um, and it's really important though, because then you're like, by this time, I want to be able to do this. And you can always adjust them. If you're like, by February 3rd, I want to be walking 10,000 steps a day. And that doesn't happen for you. And you're kind of like, oh, I'm actually at three or 4,000 steps a day. You can push that goal. You can move that goal. You can always adjust goals just to give you something to work towards. And setting long-term goals and short-term goals are really, really important. Yeah, and I think if you're, you know, those short, like the bigger goal, and then if you have those shorter ones or smaller ones to try to get there as stepping stones and you're like, hey, this is taking a little bit longer to hit these smaller goals than I was anticipating. That's already giving you that kind of idea that, hey, this might take a little bit longer than I want, but I'm still noticing my progress. Mm -hmm. And I think that kind of helps protect any of that, like, well, I'm not going to hit it or this day's around and I'm not even close. So I'm two months away. I don't think this has a snowball's chance in Hades to work. So I'm just going to stop now where it's like, nope, nope. I'm slowly working the progress. I'm working towards these other goals. It might not be on the timeline I I intended, but it's hard Mm -hmm. to predict the future. So I know if I just stick with it, I'm still working that way. It's just going to take a little bit longer than I hopefully guessed, Mm -hmm. right? It's totally an educated guess at the end of the day. And to be able to adjust and be flexible with it um, can really help you stay the course too. Totally. And I think it's hard to not be a perfectionist in this, but if you can be a perfectionist in being flexible rather than exactly hitting your goal every single time, that will get you so much further just in life in general. Be the most type A, type B person you can. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. And if you are type B, that's great. I'm a little bit jealous. Okay. So then after that, for other people, I wouldn't say after that, but for other people, it can be more reasonable to create something like a vision board. So rather than being like, I'm going to write my goals down and be super analytical about it. If you are more of a, like a visual human being, sometimes you can go through like magazines and Google and Instagram and like print off stuff. You can probably do this online. I don't know because I'm not a vision board person, but I know a lot of people who are in this works incredibly well for them. Maybe I should start. But a vision board is something that helps you really like visualize your goal by physically printing out or putting on a screen. And I know 
screens are hard. So do it in real life. It'd probably be also a good vestibular exercise to like finally cut all those things too. But reminders and aspirations, quotes, images, visual things that you can like look at for inspiration. And I actually recommend moving it around and not just take keeping it in one spot because when we start to see something all the time, we start to ignore it. It's like everyone can see their nose, but our brain ignores our nose for us. Why is that? This is why. So we want to be cognizant of that. Yeah. And I just typed in vision board maker. Big thing. Lots of people like it. Lots of people, things have it. If you have even probably like PowerPoint or mm-hmm. a Word document, oh, Google Docs, you could probably just copy and paste things as you need and um, you doesn't have to look super pretty, but get the point across. And mm-hmm. Totally. So you can make one online. Thank you. Thanks, yeah. Jenna. And I think Perfect. that kind of ties into two of like, you know yourself best. So try to make these work for you. And just mm-hmm. because it might not be something that we said or try doesn't mean that you shouldn't do it. And it might just be a better approach for you as well. Totally, totally. And the last thing of this like goals and planning section is breaking things down into actionable steps. So like, yes, a SMART goal is great because it is actionable and it is measurable and it is going to keep you accountable. But what we really want to think about is like, if I want to walk 10,000 steps a day, how am I going to get there? Am I just going to like start walking 10,000 steps a day? Like that's sort of irrational to think that you can kind of just couch to 5k it, but like couch to tomorrow running a 5k, right? Like you're going to get tired. It's going to be fatiguing. It's probably going to be too much. So like, do you have a schedule? Is there a walking plan? There's a return to run slash brisk walk plan in vestibular group fit if you need to go and grab that. But it's an important thing to be like, can I break this down? I'm going to walk 500 steps the first week, a thousand steps the second week, uh, 2000 steps the third week every day or four days a week or something like that. Like, how do I get to my goal by breaking it down into smaller chunks? Do I even have the shoes for it? No. Well, let me get a pair of shoes that I think are the prettiest, coolest things ever. And I only get to wear them when I walk. So I really look forward to walking. (laughs) We both love love shoes. I'd be like, all right, let's try to find some of the areas in it that like make you excited to want to do it. I remember this like podcast I was listening to, they turned it into a joke of like, I'm wearing yoga clothes and now I actually really want to go do yoga. Like I could do this in shorts and a t-shirt, but now that I'm wearing the fun, cute yoga clothes, I really Mm -hmm. want to go to yoga now. (laughs) Whatever works. (laughs) Whatever works. And if it's even like, well, I don't want to have to go. I'm wearing my Uggs right now and I don't want to have to change into my shoes and then I have to go outside. I have to change into my workout clothes. It's like, you don't actually have to do any of that. You can just go outside and walk. So if you're the kind of person who's like, I'm going to wear my cool new shoes, do that. If you're the kind of person who's like, I cannot even bear to think about changing my clothes. So how am I going to go for a walk? Don't change. Just go for a walk. Walk up and down your apartment complex. Walk. One, I have a friend who lives in an apartment complex that has like a loop through it. I literally walked like 55 times once because I was in a step competition with my mom. And she was like, are you done yet? And I was like, no, I have like 10 more laps in here. It's an important thing to do just wherever you are do the thing and don't try not to make excuses for yourself which is hard unless you're not having a good day then just know you know know what your barriers are gonna look like and what excuses you're gonna probably tell yourself and say Mm -hmm. all right how can I try to work around these and I know like my mom she like got a Fitbit and I was like do you really need the thing that tells you how many steps you're doing as a motivator like like you have a treadmill you can just go but like she's like no it like has reminded me when to move it like motivates me want to do it because I know it has that number at the end of the Mm -hmm. day and that's when I was like okay I'm gonna stop shoveling all my little distaste and crap talking like a Fitbit like these are actually really helpful like they're helping like someone that I love like go do like good choices so whatever works. Maybe that's not my version, but that Mm -hmm. doesn't mean I need to think that it's not good for someone else. A hundred percent. So know yourself number one. Awesome. So the next thing we want to talk about is chronic illness management. Now, this is something that if you're listening to this podcast, you are probably dealing with or know someone who is managing and dealing with a chronic thing, whether it's a vestibular disorder, whether it is something else like myself. 
So at the end of the year, I find it's a good time. And honestly, I would do this quarterly, but we're at the beginning slash end of a quarter. So um, this is something that I would do always is reviewing your treatment plan. This is not something you need to be hyper vigilant about and doing every single day, but every couple of months be like, have things changed since I tried a new medication? Have things gotten worse and I need a new routine medication, supplement, exercise program, something like that to care for myself. Should I cons- consult with my healthcare provider to review and adjust my treatment plan? Like, what are the, what does that look like? What do I need? And do I have like enough supplies and medications and things like that? Like, do I require medical equipment? Do I require a certain stash of meds? Is my insurance changing? These are things that are really important to remember, especially as we get into the new year. And if your insurance is changing, I know this comes out in December, so stock up now on medications. Do not forget, call your insurance company. See if you can get, say, honestly, if you can get like an extra refill, tell them you're going on vacation or something like that. And they will refill it ahead of time. Um, if your met, if your insurance is, uh, changing, especially not so that you can take too much, but just so you have enough. So it will last you through the change of insurance, which really frequently can make it harder to get meds. Yeah. I know too. Also there's probably more like in the fall time though there's the I hit my deductible so I'm doing my like you know my plethora of appointments and stuff so I know December you know if everyone's trying to do that it's going to be hard to get into places and there's that great deductible reset and out-of-pocket cost at the new year Um, so it might even be like a what's you know like my medical wish list almost type of thing which is a really sad thing to have to say but like, okay, I really think that maybe getting this test will give me answers or could just shed some light, but I just don't know if I want to do it mm-hmm. yet. Maybe you're like, if I hit this much or this part of whatever my insurance kicks in, because you know, your plan, like I'm going to make sure I'm reaching out to schedule mm-hmm. this. Or if I even get to this number by this time, mm-hmm. I'm going to be reaching out to that office to make sure I can still get in this year for this X, Y, Z thing. I know 100%. that again, is a lot of trying to plan and really be on top of things. But sometimes it's that like, you know, if you plan on that when you don't feel like you're going to need it or do it, if it ever shows up, you already have it. Totally. And it's as much as I literally hate the way U.S. healthcare works. If you do not know how much your deductible is and whether or not you have hit it, you can call your insurance company and ask and say like, where am I? Where am I at? And a lot of times you don't even have to call anyone. You can just make an online portal with like, if you're in the States, obviously this is true. And if you're other places, it's not, but like, uh, what is your deductible? What is, um, your like social security number and insurance number, your different things on that insurance card that you probably have. You just need to enter those, um, online. And typically it will send you to like, what is my deductible? What are my care plans? Things like that. Yeah. Although, or even just feeling comfortable with knowing what, what, like, what's this lingo even mean? Cause everyone tosses mm-hmm. it around. And I know sometimes you run into the issue of you call someone and say, Hey, I just want to know like this one thing. And the way they answer the question just gives you more questions where you're like, tell it to me. Like I'm a kindergartner having to do this. Like, is it covered or is it not? If it's not, what could I expect? Like the cost to be. And if they say totally. 80% of it, like, okay, at least uh-huh. I get a little bit better of a idea of what might be going on. Sometimes they're like, well, your deductible is this, but your out of pocket cost is this, 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 and this. It's like, okay, but my question still stands. Like, so sometimes you like gotta be, per- be persistent. If you feel like they're talking to you and you're just feeling dumb, that's not your fault. I feel like they just try to talk to you in like their set script ways. And it just really makes it hard for you to always feel confident in the information that you're getting. A hundred percent. It's impossible. They make it impossible. Healthcare is chaos. So that might be a goal of Mm -hmm. what's some common lingo so I can feel a little bit more comfortable and how to ask things or what they ask or, Mm -hmm. and how to like advocate best for yourself or something we come up with too. Totally. (laughs) Awesome. So other things that we'd consider are, are you able to prioritize yourself and your well-being into the new year. So we talk so much about like wellness culture and wellness. This is like a multi-billion dollar 
consumer economy is the wellness economy. And this is because of so many reasons and the fact that healthcare doesn't work and it's really just sick care. And we don't have to get into this rant that Jenna and I, I know have that, <laughs> that Dr. Jenna and I, I know have, just but <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about it one day, maybe, but as you know, it's a freaking mess out there. So what can you do for self care and self wellness? Now do not set your goals to be 1 million miles high. It's probably not going to work unless you are somehow some magical human being, which please tell me your ways. If you are who you can just be like, I'm going to start doing this and do it consistently every single day and do like 15 things at once. It's great if you can like work in one thing and then another thing and another thing. Honestly, if it was me and I had one thing that I needed to implement, which I do plenty of weird wellness things, believe me. But if I had to start over and start implementing just one thing, it would be sleeping. And truly, I have Dr. Jenna to thank for this. In grad school, we were roommates, and she's like, you are going to bed at 9 o'clock. And I was like, you are absolutely wrong. I am not going to bed at 9 (laughs) o'clock. And now I go to bed at 8.30 every single day. What benefit And I'm going to get from studying (laughs) for one more hour and then be really tired the next day for this test than if I just Mm -hmm. get really good sleep, try to remember what I know. And then like, if I don't know it, I can at least be well rested for the rest of my day. And I'm pretty sure my grade will be like, be about the same no matter what. (laughs) Correct. And that's how you get through grad school and also through life. Because let me tell you, I was a four or five hour kind of a human every night. And I was like, I don't need more sleep than that what are you talking about? I do. I was wrong. I can fully admit to that. Mm -mm. That's not a good idea. Sleep is the number one thing you can do for your body. And there are a lot of like wellness people, Louisa Nicola, Peter Atia, literally everyone, the, the, the health span people, I would conglomerate them into. I think they're really interesting to listen to. I listen to a lot of their podcasts and they're all like, if you are not sleeping, you can throw the supplements, the cold plunges, the sauna bag, the all the other things like out the window if you are not sleeping. It is the number one most important thing you can do. And if you cannot fall asleep, you cannot stay asleep. We will do an episode on sleep. It is incredibly important. You need to be sleeping. Yeah. So, like you can't that's the number one thing. You can't um compensate for certain Mm-mm. things. And mm-hmm. the only thing is like I guess the wellness industry will still try to kind of piggyback off things, but no one wants to sell the things that you can do for free. They might try to come up with other products to try to help the thing that's free, but whether you fully need that or not might be a little bit more up for debate or maybe like, Hey, really try these other things first before reaching out for that thing that involves more of that monetary aspect. And, you know, they Mm -hmm. could still be helpful, but like, don't feel like you need to go to that route right away. Try these other things, but the other things might take time or Mm -hmm. take a little bit more like conscious effort on your part. And then everything else is selling the pill or the device or the thing that you just Mm -hmm. set up right away and you're going to get immediate, you know, benefits and changes. And that's where it's like, well, yeah, I want the nice little immediate thing and not the like Mm -hmm. thing that takes longer setup or changes my schedule. But in the long run, like what's going to maybe be best for you is on you to decide, but totally. And the freest way to get to sleep faster is starting in the morning by 10 minutes of light. First thing, when you get up, get up, go outside or what I've been doing, because I live in a place and so does Jenna. And so does Dr. Jenna that it is dark out in the morning. When we wake up is a like 10,000 Lux box. You just put it near you. Do not stare at it. It will hurt your eyes. Someone asked, why does it hurt when I stare at it? You're not supposed to stare at it. Just put it in your like area that you're spending the morning in. Um, and that is really, really, really going to help set your circadian rhythm. Like there are things in your eyes that absorb light specifically for this. Your phone is not bright enough. The TV is not bright enough. You need to go outside and like stare near the sun. Do not stare at the sun. This is not me telling you to stare at the sun. But you do need to look into the sky at the sun at least 10 minutes, um, 30 minutes if it's cloudy. Or if it's snowy, you probably don't even have to because it's reflecting off the snow so much. (laughs) Just look (laughs) down and go outside. (laughs) Yeah, I think that's one of my big things where I have all these like high aspirations in the morning, but then it's just so dark where it's just like, 
it's dark, it's cold, I don't want to get up. Now my cat is snuggling and is comfortable and cute and warm. Like, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. I don't want to do a light it. box. And then I actually have a sunrise alarm clock. I'm getting one of those. I'm so excited. <laughs> it was gifted to me because it didn't work for our friends, like very different sleep wake schedules. So they just gave it to me. I'm like, this is expensive. Are you sure you don't want like something for it? <laughs> Beautiful. We love a sunrise but, alarm clock. My friend yeah. just released a low EMF sunrise alarm clock that's made out of Himalayan sea salt, and I'm very excited. Ooh, it's coming in February. It I'm also really has excited. like a mine has like a sunset feature wow. with like white noise to like calm you down into sleep Amazing. too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I was like, this is so bougie and fancy. Yeah. It has an app, but now I can't use wow. it because we leveled up to fiber mm. internet not just wi-fi I, oh. I don't ask me i don't know i don't know but, um but yeah, that's like my fun little self-care thing and it's like yeah a silly thing where it's like okay i'm actually getting up now it's like light out my room is lit up so i can mm-hmm. get up and like do what i need to do without having to turn the full room on and like disrupt mm-hmm. like the other person and if i'm i can remind myself if i'm getting up and doing this now i'm not going to feel rushed later or i'm not going to mm-hmm. be like i don't have enough time for this because i'm actually getting up when i said i'm going to get up so uh-huh that was sleep like this oh. freaking vital and getting yes. up first thing in the morning is good for your adrenal glands i learned that from Kate, kelly yates the dietitian you need to get up first thing in the morning so i think that's great great advice and it's free yes we have ex- some expensive alarm clocks because People have gifted them to us, but you do not need one. Literally just go outside in the sunshine. Maybe we add that to a gift list. <laughs> oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. If you need something to ask for for Christmas, ask for either there's two good ones, the hatch. And then um, the one that I am getting is called rise centered. She's great. Okay. Next things is evaluating your personal relationships. This is really hard. But this is something that I think is so important is getting rid of toxic people in your life. I feel like that's a very like tis the season thing, you know, Uh like we're kind of like riding high on like gifts and friends and family Mm -hmm. and all the like lovey cozy feelings. And I feel like a lot of that can get summed up into like, I'm so thankful for who I have in my life. But Mm -hmm. I guess sometimes we might not realize the person we're maybe thankful for maybe isn't exactly as good for Mm -hmm. us as we might think either right totally. so mm-hmm. sometimes that all that reflecting and those types of feelings of who's in our life might also kind of cloud our judgment in a way or give us like those rose tinted glasses on how we maybe view someone or something mm-hmm. I totally agree I think it's so important to evaluate these things and look I have fully kicked people out of my life on different ways. And I also have evaluated and have been like, this is a person I'm going to run a business with at Dr. Jenna. This is a person I would only grab coffee with. This is a person I'd take to dinner. This is a person I might see in a group of friends only. And this can be such a hard thing to do. But sometimes when you leave, you know when this is. You might leave an interaction with someone and feel so much worse or so drained when you're leaving that interaction, or you might even feel dizzier leaving some interactions than others. And that is something to be like, oh, I might not be necessarily needing this relationship as much as I once thought. Maybe this isn't as good for me as I thought it once was. And recognizing that is so hard and doing something about it is so hard. It is like, especially friend breakups, like feel worse, I would say in my personal life than like a romantic breakup, because it's like someone that you have known for such a long time and you love this person, you share things with this person, like they're your good friend, maybe, or a family member. Like I have fully cut off parts of my family. We don't have to get into it, but, and it's hard, but for some times for your mental health, it is so much better for you that way than the other way. Yeah. And I think sometimes to that too, you, there's also that kind of realization that you might be that to someone else, maybe not like to the like full extent, but you might be like, oh, here's the person where like, you know, maybe they only reach out to me when they need something from me. Like I 
try to reach out to them just to see how they're doing. I want to know how their life is, but it seems like they only really kind of extend that same invitation when they need something from me or asking something from me. And I know there can be a lot more to it, you know, based on everyone's situation or what they might have going on. And I remember this like chronic illness, like meditative version of something where it's like, instead of getting upset that they're not reaching out to you, you like decide to be the one to reach out instead and like see what comes up from it. But if you're like, you know, I try to do this, that, the other thing, but it just doesn't seem to work well when I'm always the one reaching out and then they're really only reaching out when they need something, you might say, I'm happy to help them if they reach out, but I can't put them on this level where I'm trying to get like good connection and friendship and support from them. Like maybe they're not at that place. Maybe they have other things going on. Maybe they don't see me as that type of person in their life. So instead of, you know, cutting myself short, I need to like, make sure I have other people for that type of interaction. So I might just be lower on their friend list where like, they're a nice person. I can count on them when I need them. And that's when I need to reach out. Mm -hmm. Totally. And I also want to also recognize that sometimes people have fewer friends or fewer people in their lives and that's also okay and sometimes this can be hard to hear be like oh my gosh I feel like I have maybe one or two people in my life and one of them is super toxic like how am I supposed to deal with that and I do want to be privy to that and recognize how fully difficult that is Um, and we're here with you 100% like we love you no matter what Um, I know people say that's weird, but people hate people without knowing them. So I don't see why I can't love people without knowing them. Um, And so I think that that can be a really hard thing, but there are other ways to try and meet people like support groups, maybe picking up a new hobby. I, my goal in 2024 is to take a pottery class. That is my goal. Um, mm -hmm, I'm, that was also my goal this year, but it never worked out. And this is an example of when a goal doesn't work out. You can just push the goal out. Um, Watch the great pottery throwdown for inspiration because that is the most wholesome community. (laughs) I love it. But the point is meeting people can be really hard. Putting yourself out there can be really hard, especially when you're feeling dizzy. Um, But picking up something that is chill, spending time at the library. I know it's a silent place, but they have talking corners. Um, Places where you feel like, hey, I might meet someone there. I'm not saying you have to go sit at a bar by yourself, right? Um, But I know dateability the dating app for people with disabilities is coming out with a friends feature at some point which i'm really excited about Fun, i know super cool um also i'm not afraid to admit this all my friends here in jackson hole i met pretty much on bumble bff so that's also a great way to meet people honestly and i have nothing wrong with that um i've been taking well i mean you, mm-hmm. you've always heard about my course catalog from the community education but in like the twin cities they have the it's kind of like a parks and rec but it's specifically through the school system so people can like teach classes and they can be on cooking or that's where I started tai chi and I decided to get back into pickleball because I just had an open gym I'm like this is the cheapest way I'll ever find pickleball in this place like and like you start to meet people you like see the same people you start to just have like little conversations and like everyone's really nice and they're like hey if anyone wants to like do some of this like activity outside of this class like you can start there or maybe you're the one that instigates that of like if anyone wants to do this a different day of the week or want to do it outside while it's still nice enough to be outside like that can be one way where you're still having that common ground and maybe you start to like whoops spread out from there but kind of like going back to like this person maybe isn't great for me but what do I do I know like it can get worse before it gets better that might be when you need some like professional help to be a professional just support person because it can get worse before it gets better usually depending on how this goes it usually ends up getting worse before it gets better just because of how a toxic person is going to react And it might be hard to move forward with them still in your life because other people might pick up on that if they're around and be like, you know, Madison, as awesome as you are, I really don't like hanging out with this other person. And if they're part of this deal, like, sorry, I can't. So they might be setting up their own boundaries and it gets complicated Mm -hmm. fast. It gets hard fast. Like there's no good rhyme or reason. Mm -hmm. I totally agree. Um, a couple other things, additional considerations. Um, 
to kind of setting goals and setting up your year 2024 for success um, is establishing a routine that prioritizes you. And I think this is something that we take like, oh, I'm just going to like go about my days, whatever, whatever. This is something that I really learned about myself in 2023 that I'm hoping to bring in 2024. So maybe you can too, um, is saying like, okay, I like to do these things. I personally, Madison, I like to be in bed at 8.30 or 9. I don't like to be out till midnight. I don't like it. Um, uh -uh. I hate it, actually. I was last week and I was like, this is my nightmare. Okay, so, (laughs) and it's people I love, but I'm just like, oh my God, I'm trying to be in bed. I like to work out first thing in the morning. That's my favorite thing to do. I love to have breakfast and a cup of coffee. I like to work and kind of do my own thing at work and schedule that for my time. But I also like to go on walks. I like to take a second to breathe. And I love my nighttime routine. I've been sauna bagging. We've been cold plunging. We've been dry brushing. It's an innocent, intense night routine. Don't add them all in at once. That was a bad call on my part. But (laughs) do do things that make you feel really good. And when you start to do the things that prioritizes you, your hormones start to even out. Your energy starts to increase. You start to feel calmer. All of these things are so important. I know it's easier said than done. It was really hard for me to get to this point. It took literal years, but it's a really important thing to be able to do. And if you can allow yourself even one thing a day that prioritizes you, I think you will really reap the benefits. Yeah. I think I did that like the opposite way where I was like, you know, just because a day or a weekend is open and there's nothing scheduled doesn't mean I'm free, which is my way of saying it's okay to say no. And just because there's nothing scheduled doesn't mean I need to schedule something and see a person or do a thing because I want that downtime. I don't want to have to be like seeing people like maybe if I change my mind, like, and it's an easy enough thing to like pop in or just say, nope, I can only do this for by this amount of time, like I'm not doing more or going longer because I still want like this much to just do my own thing and just veg and enjoy my home. Like why pay all this money to mm-hmm. be at a thing that I'm never at? Um, so I then totally I think, agree. <laughs> so I, I was like, I totally understand why my parents are like, look like hermits to the rest of the world. Like they just enjoy, they have the things they like, they do them and they can do them at home, which like more power to them. So I think Mm -hmm. trying to find those smaller things, like what's one thing I can do like on a regular basis or what's one thing I really like and just actually enjoy it. Like don't just chug your coffee or your tea. Mm -hmm. Like I'm going to sit and enjoy this time while it's still Mm -hmm. nice and warm. So I'm not like chugging it and burning it up or feeling Mm -hmm. jittery. Like I'm going to use this time for me and then I'll go on with my day. Totally. And I think that there's something to be said for habit stacking, right? Where you're doing more than one thing at once. You had the example earlier in a call we were doing of like, every time I go to the bathroom, I take a second and I breathe and hopefully the bathroom isn't smelly, but you take a second and like take a deep breath and calm down your nervous system, which is super good for your pelvic floor. This was Dr. Jenna's advice. I am stealing it. Well, you're sitting right here. So not really. So there's something to really be said for habit stacking in your private bathroom. Yeah. (laughs) Um, but there's something to be said for habit stacking like this, doing more than one thing at once, but there's also something to really be said for just doing one thing at a time and just sitting and being mindful and enjoying that moment. Yeah. Yeah. So sometimes like, you know, trying to like also keep in mind like adaptability and not Mm -hmm. like I have to do it a certain way every time or else I'm not doing it all where it's like, you know, I really enjoy reading and maybe I'm in a really good part of my book. So I'm going to enjoy my book for the length of time that I have my coffee. And maybe other days I just like only do the coffee, or maybe I just Mm -hmm. say, I'm going to do 30 minutes of reading because I just don't really feel like having anything right now, or it's too late in the day. I don't want to do that. So I think giving yourself like, how are some ways I can do this? Or maybe what are some variations that like are still great ways to, you know, count it or say I'm still working on it without it maybe looking exactly like how you think can be a nice way to help keep that consistency up too. I totally agree. And then holding yourself accountable can be really difficult. So maybe telling one person, a trusted person, they say that like, if you say you're going to write a book and then you tell everyone in your community that you're going to write a book, you're actually less likely to do it. 
because now you've gotten the dopamine rush. This is on an Andrew Huberman podcast that I heard the statistic <laughs> um, and I trust his research. So, um, but if you tell everyone around you, then you've gotten the dopamine of like, wow, you've really accomplished something and then you're actually less likely to do it. So I don't necessarily subscribe to telling everyone in your life that you're going to do something. But if you're like one trusted person, please hold me accountable. Ask me every day if I've done this thing. Um, that can be really helpful. A calendar to visualize like Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I'm walking 4,000 steps or Tuesdays and Thursdays. I'm taking an extra 10 minutes out of my day to do a meditation and starting really small, um, hiring someone to help you monetary financial stuff is actually one of the most effective ways to get yourself to do something is paying for something. You're like, oh, I'm paying for this. So therefore I'm going to do it. Um, and then setting yourself an alarm reminder, but make the reminder at different times throughout the day, because if you see it every single day at 9am, you're going to start to ignore it. I think, um, the atomic habits book too, they use like monetary as like in a negative way, which isn't always like the ideal, but sometimes like, you know, they want to like promote positive associations with the thing. Right. But I think he was like, you know, again, not everyone works like that. So this person had like a monetary, like I'm going to owe someone money or I'm going to have to like put money towards this thing that I don't really want to, if I don't do this by, you know, these time points. And that was more of a motivator for them than saying, I'm going to put money into this thing. Like I'm going to put my own work into this to avoid this mm -hmm. monetary thing. It was like, I don't know. They had to like put money into like a vacation or something that like their spouse mm -hmm. wanted. Like, I don't know. That's interesting. But I also think if you reward yourself, if you have like a jar or you like Venmo yourself, can you do that? Or like Venmo a friend or a partner or a family member who's not going to steal your money um, and be like, I'm going to send you $5 every time I do this or 50 cents every time I do this thing. And then when it end, adds up to, I don't know, I would buy myself like a pair of leggings or really nice dessert or a new mixer, probably. Um, <laughs> one of mixer those. attachment. <laughs> exactly. It's something that you really would want. And then you can buy that thing when you've done your habit so many times. So that could be a good positive motivator as well. I think the Atomic Habit book to like, also, it reminded me of like elementary school where you like do a good thing and they put like a marble in the jar. And if you fill up the marbles to this line, you get like the popcorn party and things like that. I remember that. Yes. So I think something like that too, like it can be a visual thing that doesn't have to be tied to something else. Like it could just totally. be a, when I get to this point, I do this thing. Um, mm -hmm. and then it could be that visual reminder too, of like, Oh, I didn't add it today or, Oh, it's like kind of staying at the same spot. So I think there can be other ways we could go on forever and ever about totally. this. Um, but we will make sure that we don't, we'll wrap it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we do get to talking and we don't ever stop. Um, that is the beauty of Dr. Jenna and I, well, I hope you enjoyed this. If you have questions about how to set a goal, what to do about your goals, how to, think about goals, what your goals even should be, please send either of us a DM. Um, and we're going to be talking more about goals in vestibular group fit as well, which is where you can mainly find us. Um, so we will see you there. Happy almost new year. Yeah. Happy new, new year. Weeks, but <laughs> happy holidays. Happy all the things. There we go. <laughs> happy new year as well. All right. Good luck goal setting. Do them before the new year. It's not a goal for today is to set your goals. All right. Talk to you guys soon. All Bye. right. See you later.